back in 1988, we ended up with a ship in San Francisco. Remember on Thursday night the story I told you about Russ Coughlin? That um, gentleman that was like the Walter Cronkite of Northern California? He calls me one morning and he said, Jerry, he said, I came up with an idea. He says, we've got all these World War II vessels sitting out here in Muir Island. If you know anything about the Richmond Bridge and where the Delta dumps down into the, uh, the San Francisco Bay, they, would, they just moored all these ships. And there were just, I don't know how many out there, it looked like hundreds, all from the World War II. He said, why don't we get a ship and make it a shelter for the homeless? So we decided to do that. And we took on the project, found out two businessmen had already gotten a troop carrier and placed it in Muir Island or in uh, the estuary, which is uh, the estuary was a little channel over in the Oakland side. It faced San Francisco and, and the ship was there. It had housing for 619 soldiers. It also had an enormous food capacity. It, it had 45 tons of frozen food capacity. It could go around the world one and a third times without stopping and feed 619 soldiers during that period of time. So it had a large fuel capacity and large food capacity on board. So we talked to the owners of the ship and we said, uh, man, we sure would like this for the homeless. And they said, wow, this ship is just here empty. If you'll restore the ship, we'll let you stay on the ship for nothing. And then at the end of the restoration, if you want to buy it from us, we agreed on a price. It was kind of a handshake thing, and I didn't get a lawyer and write a contract, but these seemed like good men. One was a former Coast Guard captain of the San Francisco Bay Area. So we were on the ship for quite a while, and we took the homeless on board. We chipped and painted and converted one of the cargo holes into a school of evangelism, and that's where a lot of this material began to be developed. A contractor from Sacramento said, I'll carpet the... the, the, the uh, hold, a uh, fold, or what, what do you call it? The cargo hold. <laughs> the cargo hold. I'll carpet it and we'll build a stage area in there and put couches in there and chairs and tables. And so we did our schools of evangelism on this ship. We'd go to the streets, we'd take the men off the streets and put them on the ship and put them through re rehabilitation. And it was glorious. I mean, we just had awesome team. We had a team of eight people full time on the ship and we just began to rehabilitate people. And churches from all over the Bay Area would come on the weekends and help us restore the ship, chip and paint it. And after a while, the ship really looked beautiful. I mean, it really was all painted, all finished out. One day, the Coast Guard shows up. Their lights flashing on the water side, nonetheless. And they say, you've got to abandon the ship. And I said, why? They said, because you violate 21 city ordinances for shelters for the homeless. I said, well, the city's been working with us all this time and they know exactly what we're doing. Well, what I failed to realize is they had secretly sold the ship to an Alaskan fishery for $1.3 million. We had agreed to buy the ship for $330,000. I didn't have a million three. And it looked like they were pretty serious. So the day we abandoned the ship, we walked the railing of the ship and we anointed it with oil. And all I knew is every morning I would wake up and I would ask God, are we doing the right thing? And every day I felt a green light. And now it looked like Satan was stealing the ship right out from under us. Have you ever felt like that? You're doing the right thing and you're going on and, and God gives you a green light and all at once it looks like the devil's winning. And I mean the eight staff members, I mean we all shed some tears as we got off the ship that day and had to put all those homeless back on the street. And I got a burr under my saddle. Anybody get, ever get a burr under your saddle with God? <laughs> I said, Lord, don't ever ask me to do another big project. I, I am, you know, this is, you know, I felt like a failure because the churches all were looking to us in the Bay Area. They were all excited. They put thousands and thousands of hours of restoration on this ship. If you ever want a big job, restore a ship, one ship at a time. So I just had to release it to the Lord. Well, four years later, my wife and I moved to Seattle. We're driving over the Ballard Bridge. If you know anything about Seattle, the Ballard Bridge connects you to the north end of Seattle. 
I look over off the Ballard Bridge and there's all these ships lined up down there. And lo and behold, what do I see? Our ship, the Loch Knot. And so we pulled off and we went on the ship and met this tall guy from Sweden. He was a captain now of the ship. I thought, he was a, I thought he was the head of the fishing crew. I said, Val, we come to see the fishing crew. And he, was, <laughs> and he said, well, he said, there's no fishing crew here. He said, this is God's ship. I said, what? He said, yeah, this is God's ship. I said, well, tell me what happened. The last I heard it was sold to an Alaskan fishery. He said, well, he said, they've been bankrupt. <laughs> I said, well, where's the ship going? What's happening? He said, better, better come to the captain." quarters, which I had slept there many, many nights, we sat down and had a cup of tea. He said, this ship is going to Israel. It's going to haul Jews from Odessa, Russia to Haifa, Israel, and it's going to be part of the Jewish restoration and exodus out of Russia. Now, isn't God good? He knows what he's doing out there. Amen. What I thought was a lost cause, God turned into a restoration. And I, while I was on that ship, I'd get up during the night, I'd pray, but in the morning, every morning, I'd take the Word of God and I'd say, now, Lord, teach me out of your Word how to train the people of the Bay Area to go to the streets of San Francisco. I want your teaching. And the Lord kept saying, go to the book of Mark. So I sat down and I read the book of Mark, I don't know how many times, over and over again. I like Mark because Mark was the evangelist of the four Gospels. And we learned the word last night. The most often used word in the book of Mark is the word... Immediately, Jesus immediately 40 times in the book of Mark. So I studied the book of Mark and I, I realized that it taught a lot about Jesus' authority. So let's look these verses up real quick. First Mark 1, 22. Mark 1, 22. And they were astonished his doctrine, for he taught them as one that had what? Authority, Authority and not as the scribes. <laughs> Interesting contrast there, isn't it? He taught them as one that had authority and not as the scribes. So Jesus first demonstrated his authority in his what? In his teaching. Secondly, he dem demonstrated his authority over demons. Look at verse 39. And he preached in their synagogues throughout all of Galilee, casting out the demons. We mentioned that earlier in the teaching. He also demonstrated his authority to forgive sins. Verse 10. But that you may know that the Son of Man hath power where? Where does he have that power? On earth to forgive sins. He saith to the sick of palsy, Arise, take up your bed, and go thy way. Your sins are forgiven. So Jesus exercised that earthly authority to forgive sins. I want you to take the book of John for a moment. Go over, if you will, to John chapter 20. And this is something we don't often do. And it's unfortunate. Or John 21, I'm sorry, John 21. You know, the Lord has given us the power to forgive sins as well. Whosoever sins you remit shall be what? Oh, I'm sorry. It is John 20, 21. I get, I'll get it straight. I'll wake up here this morning. John 20, 21. Then he said to them again, peace be unto you as the father hath sent me. Even so send I you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and saith, saith, said to them, receive the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost. Whosoever sins you what? Remit, they are remitted. And whosoever sins you retain, they are retained. And the Lord began to show me something that one thing we don't exercise on earth as believers is our right to release people from sins on earth. I'm telling you, when I began to teach this and people began doing it on the streets, it had awesome results. I want to demonstrate how this happens, okay? Get ready with the camera here. I want one of you to come up here for just a moment. Okay, I want one of you to come up here. I'm going to show you how to release somebody from their sins. 
Because I want you to get this. This is part of evangelism training. Oh, we already got somebody here, all right? This young man here, all right? I like him. He always has a smile on his face. <laughs> the whole teaching. What's your name? Jimmy. Jimmy. Jimmy, I'm going to lead you to Jesus, okay? okay. So I'm, I'm going to go through a conversion with him, and I'm going to show you how you release people on earth from their <laughs> sins. Because the Bible says if you don't release them, what, what happens? They're stuck in them. Do you realize the authority that God has given us on earth? Whosoever sins you remit shall be remitted. So you're, not, you're on, let's say you're on the street or whatever and you're not saved, okay? So I'm going to lead you to Jesus. Okay, your name, sir, is Jim. Jim, Jim. My name is Jerry Brandt, and I understand you came forward here as we gave an invitation this morning. You want to receive Jesus? Yes, sir. Do you, you know that Jesus loves you? He died for you. you? Do you believe that? Yes, sir. And he shed his blood for you, right? Yes, sir. Do you, do you believe this morning that you can receive him in your heart by faith? Yes, sir. Okay, so I'm going to pray with you, Jim. Let's just pray right now. And I want you to repeat this prayer with me, okay? Say, Jesus, Jesus I know you love me. I know you, love me. I know you died for me. I know you died Come, into my heart. Come into my heart. Wash my sins away. Wash my sins I, away. Receive you right now I receive you right as now as my Lord and my Savior. My Lord and my Savior. Thank, you, Jesus, Thank you, Jesus, for coming into my life. Into my life. Amen. Now, Jim, I want to tell you something. You believe that God is perfect? Yes, sir. You know, there's some verses in the Bible I want to share with you, and I'm going to speak on behalf of God right now. He's given me that permission, all right? Amen. All right. You know, the Bible says that God perfectly forgets your sins. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed your sins from you. The east and the west don't meet. There's another verse that says, Jim, he's buried your sins in the depths of the sea and he remembers them no more. So I want to tell you today, Jim, that every sin you've ever committed up to this moment, you just received Jesus, right? Yes, every sin that you've ever committed up to this moment, God has forgotten. He'll never bring them up again. Now you might, others might, but God never will because God perfectly forgot your sins. So I want to say something on behalf of Jesus right now. Jim, I declare to you that your sins are forgiven. All right? Now, that may not seem powerful, but I tell you, I was in... Go ahead and sit down. I was in Salem, Oregon, uh, doing a, a revival service there in a gymnasium with a church. And a man came uh, into the service, and he sat right near the front, and he had alcohol smell all over him. <laughs> So we were greeting each other as you do in a service, and I turned around and I shook his hands, and uh, when I shook his hand, God gave me a word for him. I said, sir, uh, I want you to know that after today, you're never going to take another drink. God's going to set you free, free from your alcohol today. His response was really interesting to me. He said, you're not going to embarrass me, are you? <laughs> you would think somebody would rejoice, right? if they're going to be set free from alcohol. It was evident he was an alcoholic. That wasn't a word of knowledge. It was evident because he smelled like alcohol on Sunday morning. So anybody that stinks like alcohol on Sunday morning, you got a pretty good chance he's an alcoholic. So I got up to preach, and I noticed he ran out of the service. He was gone. And I started, you know, during my message, I mean, in the back of my mind, it's like the devil's condemning me, saying, you blew that guy right out of the saddle, man, by what you said. But I just went on with the message because I believe it was a word from God that he was going to be set free that day. So I got to the invitation. I didn't know he only lived a block or so down the street from the, uh, the place where we were having the meeting. He had slipped in the back of the auditorium or the gymnasium at, at, toward the end of the message. And when I gave the invitation, he literally came running to the front. And I prayed with him a sinner's prayer just like I did with Jim. And there was really no real strong emotional response. He received Jesus. He told me, he said, you know, I went home and thought about it. He said, why should I go, go to hell? <laughs> because of my pride. And he says, I wanted to come back and receive what you had. So I, I, I led him to Jesus. And then I did this. I said, sir, Jesus wants me to tell you something. Jesus wants me to tell you today that when you accepted him in, in your heart, your sins are forgiven today. All your sins from your past are forgiven. And he stood there for a moment, and then he let out a groan. I mean, I have never in my life heard a guy groan so deep. He went, oh, like that, and he fell to his knees. And this guy began to weep until there was literally a puddle on the gym floor from his weeping. And I realized something 
When we lead people to Jesus, if we don't release them from their sins, they don't get released. You've been given the same authority that Jesus had to forgive sins on earth, not in heaven. There's only one that can forgive sins at the, at the throne room. Who is that? Jesus. When I received Christ as, as a nine-year-old boy, Jesus turned over to the Father on my behalf, and he, he said to the Father, this young man, Jerry, Father, is coming through me, through my shed blood. Will you receive him? You see, we're, 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 it's based on his righteousness, not ours. But on earth, we must exercise this right of releasing people from their sins. Uh, I'm going to take just a moment here, if I can, and I'm going to take you to an India revival, if I can. I'm going to show you this actually in Ashkin. Is, is that good? Can I just take a minute to do that? All right. I believe this is the right one. Oops. Real player is there. Oh, I promised to show you this also. I'll just go ahead and show you this at the same time. It has to do with the authority thing, and then I'll go back on the uh, player. I want you to hear this. Remember, I promised to show you the video of the testimony of the Indian who's raised these people from the dead. Okay, turn, turn that up if you would, okay? and disease. Just look it up, Mark 5, if you will, for a moment. Mark 5, verse 34. And he said to her, Daughter, thy faith has made thee whole. Go in peace, and behold of thy plague. We're going to look closer at that later, that kind of a healing as we get into the healing teaching. He had authority over death. Mark chapter 5, verse 41. And he took the damsel by the hand and said to her, Talitha kum, which is being interpreted, Damsel, I say to thee, arise. And straightway the damsel arose and walked, for she was of the age of 12 years. And they were astonished with great astonishment. Jesus exercised his authority over nature. Mark 4, 39. By the way, we've had to do a lot of that outdoors, having ministry outside. And he arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. So we're seeing the areas in which Jesus exercised his authority on earth. Now let's get into chapter, uh, or verse 29 here. I'm in 29, page 29. Here, I'll get it together. I take another look at the evangelism style of Jesus. Actually, we need to go back to... Um, 26, yeah, 26. Actually, uh, verse 20, uh, 24. 24, all right? I thought we had stopped it later, but actually this section starts at 24. Jesus came to bring heaven to earth. His prayer reflects his passion that he had to see what he knew in heaven become reality on earth. He said, Father, thy kingdom come, thy will be done as in heaven, so on earth. Jesus, of course, totally understood the rulership of the Father over all creation. He understood the Father's awesome creative power and therefore the Father's ownership of all things. He knew the absolute sovereign reign of the Father over all creation. Jesus knew that transitioning that authority from heaven to earth would be his main mission. He did this by demonstrating how the kingdom of God works. He did this through example, teaching, training, raising up a small group of disciples that he believed would take the earth. We've already quoted this verse, if I cast demons out by the finger of God, then has the kingdom of God come upon you. After Jesus' death and his ascension to heaven, the early apostles still continued the message of the kingdom. There was never a time the message ceased. So let's jump over to the next page, uh, top of the page. Peter in the book of Acts preached a clear message of the kingdom of God. Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you. In the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, we covered this page, didn't we? Verse 25, okay, let's go to page 26. Now, there was a relationship that Jesus had with the Father, and that's found in the book of John. Of all the four Gospels, John really spent the time in intimacy with Christ. He was called the beloved disciple. And John unle unleashes to us the secrets or unlocks the secrets of Jesus' relationship with the Father. 
I believe that the Father shared with John these things that he didn't share with the other disciples. You know, love really does release revelation. When you really fall in love with God, God's going to show you things. And because John was so close to Jesus that he could even lay his head on his breast, I'm sure John said, Jesus, would you tell me about your relationship with the Father? Because the other four, three Gospels do not discuss what we're now going to teach for the next few moments. And Jesus shared with John three secrets of transitioning heaven to earth. The first was Jesus always did the Father's will. He always did the Father's will. Jesus said to him in John 4, 34, My meat is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Not my work. His work. Of myself I can do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just, because I do not seek my own will, but the will of the Father which hath sent me. Interesting that Jesus made a distinction between his human will and the will of the Father here. <laughs> That's interesting, isn't it? He said, I don't seek my will. Remember in the garden? He said, Father, if there's any other way, can this cup pass from me? He knew the tremendous suffering he was going to go into. But so Jesus had a will to exercise. But doing the will of the Father showed Jesus what to do on earth. It showed Jesus what to do on earth. By the way, the key to doing God's will is hearing God's voice. You must develop an ear to hear the voice of God if you're going to walk in the will of God. And then that voice increases and grows as you immediately obey it. I always get further revelation when I obey the Lord. You know what? If I can go back and find out where I got off track, I always get off track when I refuse to obey God's voice in some point. If I go back and repent of that, then I say, God, just I desire to hear your voice. I want to hear what you're saying to me today. I want to be in the center of your will. Now, the first voice that we hear from God is the voice of his what? His word. Everything in this book is God's will. So you don't have to question when you read this book whether you're doing God's will if you're doing what it's saying. So I, I, when I read the Bible in the morning, I have my devotions. I always, always ask God to show me something that day that I can walk out on earth to perform His will in what I read. So the Word of God is the first voice of God to us. It's very evident and very clear. So it's really not hard to hear this, although you need to have spiritual eyes when you read it. And ask for revelation, knowledge, because you can know the Bible and still not know God intimately. The Pharisees were good at that. So you need to know the Word of God. And you need to hide the Word of God in your heart. The more you ingest of the Word of God, the more you will do the will of God. Because this creates a God mindset. So when you face questions during the day or trials or tribulations or temptations, you can go to a verse that you've hidden in your heart. What does the Word of God say? My, thy word have I hidden in my heart that I, I might not what? Sin against thee. So this is a built-in immunization to sin. Meditate upon these things, Paul wrote to Timothy. Give thyself wholly to them that thy profiting may appear unto all. For in doing this you shall both save yourself and them that hear thee. 1 Timothy chapter 3. Meditate on these things. Med what's meditation? It, it's the word chew the cud. How many are raised on a farm? Nobody. Oh, one person. Oh, it's, oh Angela back there. Cindy, were you raised on a farm? Where? North Carolina. North Carolina. I, we had a dairy farm when we grew up. My dad used to shake me out of bed and my brother every morning at 4.30. We had to milk 80 head of Ayrshire cattle before I went to school. Not each by hand, but with the stanchions and all that. We had one old cow. Her name was Molly. I'll never forget Molly. She, we had a way of, of measuring the butter 
fat from the cows and the ones that produced the best butter fat. And Molly was by all means the, the top producer. But I noticed Molly was the be best meditator we had. We would chop the insulation, the corn, put it in a silo in the morning. We'd feed uh, in a trough. We'd feed all our cattle. And Molly would always, she was boss. She'd always rule the trough. She, she, when she stepped up, the other cows stepped aside. She was just kind of, you know, that kind of a cow. <laughs> and she would just gorge herself with food. And then she walked over to the water tank, and she would tank up. Have you ever watched a cow tank up? They will stand and drink for 20 minutes. And what they do is they fill all five of those stomachs that they have filled with food, they fill it with water. And now Molly began her meditation. She went over to a corner of the corral and she would meditate the rest of the day. Her five stomachs are designed to re redistribute the food up into her cud. And Molly was making us milk through her meditation. That's the Greek word, meditation. So when you get the word inside of you, you're able to bring it up and meditate, chew the cud on it, right? <laughs> Think about it. Let it become a part of your mental process. And you'll produce some good spiritual milk, right, <laughs> for the Lord. Maybe some meat, too. <laughs> and good butterfly fat, right. Thy word have I hid in my heart. So we cannot get by the word of God. And the second voice that we need to hear is the voice of the prompting of the Holy Spirit. We hear God's voice by this prompting. Do you ever hear that inner voice of the Holy Spirit that begins to talk to you and tell you what's going on in your life and begin to convict you and maybe uh, give you direction and maybe give you a word about something that's going to happen in your life? Even a prophetic word can come. The voice of the Holy Spirit. And that's what I begin to really learn to tune into on the streets of San Francisco. I begin to hear God's voice. I mentioned it last night. Uh, you, you can really develop an ear to hear God's voice if you, if you really desire to. Again, my sheep hear my voice. Third, we can hear God's voice through others, through the prophetic word of others. Sometimes people will have a word for us. And they'll speak right into the need of our heart. Now, these are godly ways we can hear the voice of God. But we, almost, we need to be aware also that there are other voices vying for our attention. There are demonic voices. They'll ride on your shoulder, create fear. They'll start whispering in your ear saying, you know, you're not going to have enough money at the end of the month. God isn't faithful. I was awakened one night at 3 a.m., which I seem to get a lot up at 3 a.m. I don't know if that happens when you get older or what, but I was up this morning at 3 a.m. And I went over to my computer because I felt like the Holy Spirit prompted me. He said, I'm going to teach you why all mankind has not yet received Jesus, at least those that have heard the gospel. I said, okay. I have a page on my computer that's called Prophetic Word, where I get these revelations from God that I, I record them, and it's a large file now. And I said, teach me, Lord. And I just started praying in the Spirit. And the Word started coming to me. The world believes the lie. I said, okay, Lord, what is the lie? Not a lie, the lie. He said, here is the lie, and this is the reason that all mankind that has heard the gospel has not yet received it. Here is the lie that the Lord taught me that night. God is not good. Almost everybody I've witnessed to that hasn't found Jesus blames God for something. Either he wasn't, they don't think he was there for them or he caused some bad thing to happen in his family or he's causing bad things to happen in the world. Why does God allow these wars? Why, is, why, is, why are these nations hungry? If there's a God, why? The devil uses this lie. He used it with Eve. He convinced Eve that God was withholding good from her. And his lie has not ceased up to this present time. So the way to counteract God's 
or the, the, the lie of the devil or the Satan is with God's truth. And what is God's truth? God is good. Every act of God is an act of goodness. From the Father of lights with whom there is no variableness or shadow of turning. That's God's goodness. That's what the New Testament says. God is good. And His goodness never casts a shadow. What does that mean? There's only one moment on the Roman sundial that there's no shadow. When is it? Noon. High noon. What the writer was saying is God's goodness is always at high noon. Never casts a shadow. It's always at its optimum. Everything in our life that happens, happens because of God's goodness. If you don't have that revelation, I guarantee you, your faith and my faith gets attacked with this lie all the time. And there are even Christians that don't believe God's good. So how do we win the world? We win the world, I really believe, by, by living the goodness of God and by sharing the goodness of God. We're going to see that in Project Light. But these voice of demons, how do you counteract the voice of demons in your life when they whisper in your ear? With the Word of God. Just like Jesus did in Luke chapter 4. As it is written. And that's why it's so important to have that Word on the, on the edge of your tongue. God has not given us a spirit of fear. So when that fear comes, what do you say? Wait a minute, that's not from God. We're not talking about the fear of the Lord, which is the beginning of wisdom. That's an awesome reverence toward God. We're talking about a fear that comes, that something evil is going to happen, that, that bad things are, are coming to you, and, and, and uh, the lie of the devil. And, and so these demons speak all the time. And, and so I just counteract them with the Word of God. I just quote Scripture to them. Amen? Amen. <laughs> when they come along, just quote Scripture to them. And finally, there's the inner voice of man. The inner voice of man is really interesting. This is our most difficult thing to discern. Because the inner voice of man can sound religious. You know what I'm saying? You know my definition of religion? Is flesh at its best. Still not spirit, but it's flesh at its best. And religious people can do the most awesome things. You say, wow, that is so great. But how do we know... The voice of God and the voice, inner voice of man. How do we discern the difference between those two voices? Boy, I'm sure glad for John 7. Let's turn there real quickly. John 7, 17 and 18. You'll love this. This is worth the whole teaching right here. Because it's going to help you discern from now on how to hear the voice of God compared to your own voice. And it's really not that difficult, but we make it difficult. John 7, 17 says... If any man wills to do his will, he shall know the teaching, the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I what? Speak from myself is literally the, the original. The New King James says speak of myself, but it literally means from myself. Now look at verse 18. This is the key to knowing the difference between your voice and the voice of God. For he that speaketh from himself seeketh what? His own glory. But he that seeketh the glory that is sent him, the same is true, and there's no wrong motive in him or unrighteousness in him. So that inner voice that is talking to you, to whom is it drawing the glory? Is it bringing glory to God or is it bringing glory to yourself? Is it satisfying your desire or, or is it satisfying the desire of God? This takes practice. But it really helped me when I get this, got this revelation about my self voice because Jesus dealt with this himself. The inner voice of man in the garden. And he won. He said, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. Again, drawing a distinction between his will and the will of the Father. He had to daily submit his will to the Father, just like us. It 
So the, the inner voice of man always seeks his own glory. So first of all, Jesus always did the what of the Father? The will of the Father. Secondly, Jesus always did the what? Works of the Father. He always did the Father's works. Doing the will of the Father showed him what to do. Doing the works showed him how to do it. Jesus answered them in John 10, 32. Many good works have I showed you from my Father. These didn't come from me. Jesus did no works on this earth. He did not take credit for one work. You show me in the book of John where Jesus took credit for one work that he did. Not one. I must work the work of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. John 9, 4. For the Father loveth the Son and showeth him all things that he himself doeth. For he will show him greater works than these that you may marvel. How did Jesus get shown in a practical way? Now, how did Jesus get shown the works of the Father while he was walking on this earth? Did he, abiding, did he get mental pictures of what to do? Did he hear an inner voice, which was the Holy Spirit upon him, the anointing and in him? How did these works translate from heaven to earth? So he knew exactly what to do, how to pray for people, what to say, how to deliver them, what, what approach to use in healing, what approach to use in deliverance. He was so tuned in with the Father that the Father showed him everything to do. Now, wouldn't you like to walk into that kind of anointing? There was a man, by the way, which covers the next point. Uh, his, his name is Samuel. You know that not one word of Samuel fell to the ground his entire life? That's what it says in the book of Samuel. Every word out of Samuel's mouth was anointed in his lifetime. <laughs> not one word fell to the ground. That, that's pretty awesome to walk under that kind of a power of God. What, uh, what revelation will change the way you minister? Well, it's this revelation that Christ in me performs the works. It's not me doing it. It's Christ doing it through me. Again, it is not who we are, it's who we are under. So we can get into such a flow of the Holy Spirit of God that when we go around, it's the work of Christ flowing through us to the world. Does that make sense? I mean, it's no different than if Jesus were here in person because he is here through the bride. Now, I want to walk in that kind of an anointing. That should be our desire. That's the highest plane we can walk on in evangelism is be so tuned in with God that if he says, stop at this house, walk up to the door, I have a word for the person in this house. I've heard that happening to people. That there's such an anointing on your life and you're so tuned in and abiding in Christ and you're so full of, of the word of God and you're so open to the spirit of God that whatever he says do, you're going to answer people properly. You're going to minister to, wouldn't you like to be married to somebody like that? That every person, every word out of their mouth in your marriage was anointed. We've got to be careful what we speak. Thirdly, Jesus always spoke the Father's words. For he whom God hath sent speaketh the words of God, for God giveth not the Spirit by measure to him. Ooh, I like that. For I have not spoken of myself, but the Father which sent me, he gave me commandment, what I should say, what I should speak. And I know that his commandment is life everlasting. Now look at this phrase. Whatever I speak, therefore, even as the Father has said to me, so I speak. Every word after Jesus was anointed into the abiding with the Father, every word that came out of his mouth on earth was from the Father. This is how you transition heaven to earth. Are we getting this? You get into the same flow that Jesus got into. And this is why I'm teaching this. I love it. Speaking the word of God into a situation releases the power of creation. The power of creation. I want to tell you a story from Reinhard Bunke real quick. This is a tremendous story. I heard him speak to a whole bunch of pastors, about 200 pastors up in Seattle one time, and he was telling his personal story. He said, I went to Africa, 
And he said, the first four years I was in Africa, I was probably the worst missionary in the world. He said, I was absolutely an utter failure. He said, like everything I was trying, nothing worked. He said, I had a grand total of 47 converts in four years. And he said, I went home one day and I told my wife, pack up. We're leaving Africa. He said, I missed God's call. I apologize to you. I apologize to you for dragging you and the family all the way down here to Africa. He was totally discouraged. And his wife said, Reinhardt, I know you. She says, I'm your wife. I'll do what you say. But she said, I ask you to do one thing for me before we leave Africa. Will you fast and pray for three days? Get alone with God. And if God does not speak to you in three days, she said, I won't say another word. We'll pack up and go back to Germany. So Reinhardt said, man, I got alone with God. And he said, I began to pray. And he said, it was like heaven was like brass. You ever get there where, you know, it's just like heaven's, you just feel no connection. He said, I prayed the first day, fasted. I prayed the second day, I fasted. He said, I prayed the third day. He said, nothing was happening. And he said, I was just thinking, I don't know. I just really don't hear the voice of God. I don't feel called down here. I'm not, I'm not a success. But he said, at the, end, at the evening of the third day, he said, I was just pouring my heart out to God. He said, and I had become so emotionally burdened, I couldn't even weep before the Lord. But he said, all at once, I began to weep before God. And I said, God, what is happening? And he said, the voice of God came to me clearer than I've ever heard it. And this was what God told him. And this is what transformed Reinhard Bunke's ministry to Africa. This moment in his life. He said, this is what God said. And Reinhardt, my word in your mouth has the same power as my word in my mouth. He said, it came like a revelation to me. He said, all I had been talking was defeat, quitting, discouragement, doubt, depression. That's all I've been talking to my wife. That's all I've been talking to God. And he said, I had a picture of Africa going before my eyes. And he said, I saw the blood of Jesus start on one side of Africa and cover across Africa. And he said, when I stopped weeping before God and got off my knees, he said, God gave me a vision of a blood-bought Africa. And God said, Reinhardt, I have called you to change this nation. He went home and he told his wife, he said, I repent. He said, I apologize. He said, God told me to change my confession. He said, I will never say again, God can't. And he has preached to over a million people a night in Africa. That's how important it is to hear the voice of God. Imagine how many millions of souls wouldn't be in heaven today if a Reinhardt Bunke went home from Africa. How important is it to hear the voice of God? What kind of power is his words, is in the word, are his words through us? The power of life. Life and death is in the power of the tongue. And they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. All right, now we're at page 29, all right? We're going to take a break, all right? After we come back, we're going to start in 29. I'm just getting warmed up now, all right? It took me a while this morning, and we're going to get there. All right.